Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to make an announcement. So after this uh, seminar, there is a, a GSAC happy hour event. And we would like encourage everyone to attend that, socialize with everyone. Um, it is going to be held at uh, Legends. So um, we encourage everyone. Looking forward to see you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So it's a pleasure today to have a very special speaker. Uh, for the uh, people in the plasma area, but not only, Professor Livia Casali from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, so it's, it's also an honor because we, we, we're both Italians. So it's, uh, it's one of the rare, you know, uh, times that I can speak in Italian with a colleague. So, um, okay, so Livia graduated at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and the Max Planck Institute in Garkin. So in in Europe between Italy and, and Germany. And she did a lot of experience in the, in the field of fusion sciences. Uh, she's a, an early career award from the Department of Energy. She started at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, what, a couple of years ago? A couple of years ago, right? After moving from uh, D3D, from General Atomics in San Diego, uh, she did a lot of studies on uh, core edge integration. And I think it's, uh, you will hear uh, much more from her about this today. So with this, I would like to introduce Livia, and you already have the microphone. Uh, I think I need to turn it. Okay. Okay, does that work? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Louder. How about now? Better? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, so thank you so much, uh, uh, David, and everyone else for inviting me to be here today. I had a really interesting conversation so far, and uh, I am joined to the campus and uh, how many capabilities you guys uh, are having here to, to learn specifically about plasma, but not only about plasma. Uh, so it's uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, as uh, David has said, I'm at the University of uh, Tennessee, and I work in uh, nuclear fusion. And I'm going to tell you some things about um, core edge integration and power exhaust, specifically in tokamaks. I wanted to introduce myself first. Um, I just uh, uh, like to show how, you know, uh, chasing uh, your dream can lead you really far away around the world. So I, I'm Italian and I, I studied between Italy and Germany. I did my PhD and my master's thesis actually already at the Max Planck Institute. Then I went to San Diego. I remember when I left, I just had a little, little uh, bag and, you know, sunglasses. I'm like, okay, I'm going to San Diego, California, <laughs> uh, working, you know, one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, tokamaks in the world. Um, so then uh, I was at General Atomics. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's me here and there inside the, the, um, the tokamak. And, and then uh, from there, I uh, moved to, uh, to Tennessee a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, this has been, you know, my my past uh, working on on fusion, and then um, I always like to mention this interesting fact about me. Uh, I actually graduated at the Academy of Rome in ballet, and I was a professional ballet dancer. I always joke and I say like, you know, I always stop, you know, dancing. Then I moved to Germany, and you know. Uh, I started drinking beer, which is something I never done until that point. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so I, I like to mention this because, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of uh, uh, skills that I acquired back then during my ballet time, they turn out to be very useful in science. And, uh, and this is something that I always tell my students because I think it's very encouraging to also do other things. Uh, that is, you know, just starting, 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 uh, because who knows, maybe some, you know, skills like, you know, perseverance, hardworking, being a team player, um, they actually might come back uh, useful later on in your life uh, in uh, the, in ways that might be unexpected. But that uh, um, that was my case uh, with, uh, uh, with ballet, for instance. All right, so I'm going to trying this time to uh, tell you about uh, uh, courage integration and tokamaks, uh, radiative cooling, and some of the impurity transport studies have done, uh, the world detachment, uh, uh, and how, for instance, we have applied this in close of geometries, and then I'll uh, conclude and talk about some consideration for reactors. 
So I don't know how many of you are so familiar with this. So I, I, I just started from very simple, uh, from the very beginning, and then I will escalate pretty quickly. So stay with me. Um, so, well, we in a nuclear fusion, right? What we do is we, you know, fuse deuterium and tritium, and this uh, goes together to produce uh, uh, a lot of energy, right? Helium and neutrons. Uh, the conditions in order to achieve fusion are we want to have high temperature to, you know, overcome the column barrier. We want to have this high temperature to be maintained for a sufficient confinement time and with a sufficient ion density uh, in order to obtain this uh, net yield of energy. So we talk about a, a triple product, also known as the low zone criteria, which is the product of NT tau. Um, using uh, tokamak, so the, the way uh, that um, we do this, we have the toroidal field coils, right? They produce the toroidal field. Uh, then we have a central solenoid that you can think about like a, a transformer that can use the toroidal current in the plasma and this produce the poloidal field. And then we have the vertical field coils uh, that uh, produce you know, the, the plasma position and the, the uh, plasma shape. I'm supposed to be there, by the way, or I'm just like, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and the plasma shape. Uh, so now, when we design a tokamak, a fusion reactor, plasma confinement is a really a key factor. Uh, however, is uh, limited by the heat transport. So what happens is that uh, we heat in the center, and then uh, the hidden particles they diffuse towards the edge, they cross the separatrix, and then following the magnetic field line, reach the uh, diverter region, which is uh, the main region of the plasma exhaust, as you can um, see here from the, uh, uh, do I have a mouse? Yes, from, from this point, okay. So now here I'm showing you a, a picture of the uh, of the diverter, which is this main region of the plasma exhaust. Now these uh, heat fluxes uh, on the material surface can exceed the, the one of a rock nozzle. So just to give you an idea of the problems that we have uh, ahead of us, if we do not mitigate these power fluxes in um, future reactor, these are going to be above 200 megawatt per square meter, uh, and uh, we saw, uh, we actually, so we know from the material point of view that uh, these uh, uh, target heat loads, they need to be below 10 megawatt per square meter. And another important condition is actually that the temperature at the target needs to be uh, below 5 EV in order to reduce erosion. And this is another important uh, component, the temperature that needs to be below for because of the erosion. And so you understand that uh, uh, this is very challenging. And there are practically two important things that we need to do. On one side, there is a material research, and I think you guys here are doing a lot of good material research to try to uh, address this problem on the material physics and components. And the other thing that we can do is to increase the power dissipation to more than 95% and, and try to dissipate this power before it arrives to this component. And this is where I dedicate most of my research uh, really try to dissipate this power. So um, practically integrating the hot core with the, the cold edge is one of the greatest challenges that we have in fusion science. And the, the, the reason that you, you can see this very quickly, right? You want to have uh, a fusion in, uh, in the center, right? So you have to have a very hot core, uh, but then your edge uh, right near your material component because of this material needs to be cold. And, uh, um, and so these, you have two different regions now that they need to go together. Uh, so the diverter design uh, must uh, simultaneously accommodate uh, the requirement from the core plasma and the one from the edge, uh, which are very different. So you want to, uh, think about the challenge in kind of two terms. On one side, you want to achieve high confinement, which is compatible with the power handling, and then you want to control this uh, the very heat flux without um, degrading the core performance. Uh, achieving this goal uh, really requires a detailed physics understanding and establishing the basis for the core edge um, integrated scenario. I just wanted to mention that uh, it's not just me saying that this is a really important problem, but this has been recognized uh, by, for instance, uh, the 
2020 DOE um, FISAC report on fusion, which uh, you know I've identified as uh, the priority number one, really addressing the core and exhaust integration challenge. And as well as uh, uh, from the 21 National Academy of uh, Science report. So these are really important problems that the fusion community is, is trying to address. One key um, region that we have uh, in Tokamak is what is called the H-mode pedestal. This is really the interaction between our hot core and the cold edge. Um, so um, before the kind of the 80s, one way to operate was called the uh, L-mode, which is stands for low confinement mode. And then during the 80s, actually, uh, the machine in ASDEX, which was the machine was before the one I work with uh, in Munich, they discover the H mode, which stands for a high confinement. So practically it was discovered that if you would have put enough feeding power, the plasma would have uh, transition spontaneously to this uh, high confinement. So you can see how uh, the, the density and the temperature, uh, they have this pedestal here in this region, and then uh, uh, they, they achieve this high, high pressure. And this region is um, characterized by uh, an edge transport barrier. Uh, practically, there is a suppression of the turbulence in this region, which is uh, key for the confinement. And uh, this really happens in this 5%, the outermost 5% of the confined region. However, this doesn't really come for free because now this uh, confinement operation is accompanied by what we call the, the ELMS, the age localized mode, which expels uh, particles in it out of the plasma. And uh, uh, these are not tolerable in future devices. So this is another area uh, where uh, we are seeking uh, to uh, ways to uh, mitigate, avoid uh, these instabilities. And so this is what I was mentioning you. Uh, you can, so this is the radia profile, for instance, of the density. So as you can see, you have the core plasma and then you have the edge plasma and these interact in, in this region, and uh, uh, which is the pedestal region. And these two regions are completely different. On one side, you have a, a hot core of the tens of the KV is fully ionized is a local lesionality. On the other side, at the edge of the plasma, uh, you have a scrape of layer that is cold, a few of tens of EV, is not fully ionized. And now the scrape of layer, and you're probably very familiar with this, involves plasma interaction with the solid material, so PMI, force wall, plasma facing components, erosion, and of course, interaction with neutrals. So things are getting really complicated out there. And uh, I always like to show this, this figure because I think it really shows uh, how complex uh, is the physics that uh, now is happening uh, out there in the scrape of layers. So uh, there is, uh, and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail in a second, but just give you an idea, once the power is out in the scrape of layers, so in the uh, open region, and uh, now you have impurity radiation, ionization and dissociation, recombination. So the physics is very complex. So first of all, it uh, makes it uh, um, uh, impossible to uh, have uh, scaling approaches. And it also means that we need to use uh, a coupled uh, uh, fluid and kinetic codes. Probably you have maybe heard about some of these uh, like SOPI as either um, uh, edge 2 d irene new edge uh, in order to uh, pin down the physics. And I will show you some examples where we have uh, um, used this code to really uh, do some uh, interpretative modeling. Um, this is the main question that we want to answer. And it is really like, how can we reduce the ver power is load in order to match the technological limit? So this question will come, will continue through, through the talk. Well, one way that we can do this is through radiative cooling to promote radiation while we need to do this uh, minimizing cone performance. So you can imagine that uh, you can in, insert these impurities uh, however, to in order to radiate some powers away. However, this radiation is to be compatible with the dilution because you don't want to dilute your plasma with MHD uh, activities. 
uh, so instability that can uh, arise in in the core from that and uh, um, of course um, if you know these impurities can can leak and and go up, uh, accumulate into the plasma um the question that you might want to ask uh, say okay I, I i understand i can use impurities to radiate this uh this energy out but how do i choose which is the right impurity if i want to radiate in a specific region of the plasma and the answer comes from the atomic data um, right there on uh, uh, on the right so uh, you can see for instance that uh, nitrogen and carbon radiates a very low temperature and then they are fully ionized at high temperature uh, whereas argon and krypton they still radiate significantly at high temperatures uh, tungsten is even up there is now in now in this plot so they radiate a lot in in the core so for instance argon and krypton are good candidates for uh, main uh, mantle radiation uh, whereas carbon and nitrogen are a very good candidates for edge and uh, uh, diverter this technique of uh, uh, impurity seeding is already required in tungsten machines, uh, but it will be mandatory for reactors where we need the, really the maximum the radiation and very high percentage of uh, mantle radiation. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, an example here on when we were doing studying in ASDEX upgrade uh, with the nitrogen seeding where um, we uh, practically, we were injecting nitrogen uh, that we can see here. Um, okay, we were injecting here nitrogen into the plasma. And then what we were seeing is that the radiation was increasing as expecting, but surprising the plasma store energy was also increasing. So the store energy of the plasma, the confinement was increasing. And uh, we wanted to try to understand what was, was happening. We saw up to a 40% uh, confinement improvement. And uh, uh, for instance, we ran some code to uh, see what was happening in the core transport. And we could clearly see that the transport was not changing and that the losses were happening at the edge so these improvement must have come from the edge of the plasma and then later on was was shown that uh, uh, indeed this effect was coming from the edge and then move to the core through a profile stiffness of the profile. And practically what, what was happening, as you can see uh, here from this plot, uh, um, in, in simple word, uh, uh, the impurity is just changing uh, a little bit the stability of the plasma by uh, moving the density profile in or out. Uh, and so this was actually really good news because we, uh, we need to use these impurities to radiate and if we use them right, we can actually even improve confinement. So that's good. Uh, one important effect uh, uh, that uh, uh, we also need to take into account when talking about uh, uh, impurities are the effect of uh, uh, the, the so-called non-coronal effects. So if you think about like the impurities enter the plasma cell neutrals and then they are subsequently ionized. Now, if we neglect the plasma transport, uh, uh, so we have a balance between the ionization and the recombination. We have a situation uh, that happens in the solar corona, uh, and so we call it coronal equilibrium. And in that case, your radiation can be expressed simply as the product of the electron density, the purity density, and the LZ, which is this efficiency of impurity. So this what I was showing you, these peaks so that you were seeing for the impurity I was showing you here, which is a function of the temperature. However, at the plasma edge, that, that's a good approximation for the core. But at the plasma edge, where you have a very steep gradient, which I showed you before, and you have these impurity, these uh, instabilities, these elms, uh, there is uh, a big radial transport that we cannot neglect. And therefore, this coronal approximation is not good anymore uh, because now LZ is not only a function of the temperature, but must be a function of NT tau, where tau is uh, the impurity confinement time. And in the plot there on the right, uh, you can um, see, for instance, uh, that if, uh, uh, so this is the same uh, LZ for different uh, uh, approximation for uh, uh, the end tau. So if we would have used the coronal approximation, which is the magenta, compared to what the real value is, which is the red, you can see that we would have underestimated of our radiation quite significantly at the edge. Um, so 
we were able to take it, this into account by developing a self-consistent model, which was taking into account uh, uh, also these uh, non-coronal effect uh, uh, for uh, low ZD impurities. For high ZD impurities, actually, these effects are not um, too important because of their high ionization rates. And this is a very important, uh, uh, by the way, uh, information if you're trying to uh, calculate uh, uh, how much uh, impurity uh, concentration if you need, uh, you will need to achieve detachment, uh, which I'm going to um, show you uh, in a little bit. Um, so, okay, how can we reduce our power loads to match the technological limit? So one way, uh, we said radiation, and uh, the other way is called the viral detachment. Did you hear about the viral detachment before? Some of you never, yeah. <laughs> uh, the viral detachment, which is a cold and dissipative diverter with temperature below 2 EV with reduced heat and uh, particle flux. So this is a nice uh, sketch that shows you, you know, you can think about detachment. So if you have an attached plasma that's in like black, so you have very uh, big uh, uh, heat fluxes on, on your target, uh, and instead, you know, as you go more and more detached, this uh, um, heat flux is, is reduced. Now, historically, detachment is achieved with a high gas path. So we pop a lot of gas and we are able to de de detach the diver. Uh, but um, this is often associated with the decrease in uh, uh, confinement. I just want to show you here because you might also be familiar with that. Uh, this is, you know, the way, for instance, we measure detachment is using the Lamiar probes, right? So this is taken as the uh, rollover of the uh, ion saturation uh, current. Um, the process that leads to the detachment, uh, you can think about the, pro uh, the process as uh, uh, practically, you know, your um, power mm, in the scrape of layers goes down and you meet the impurity radiation zone, you are around 10 EV where carbon and nitrogen, as I just showed you from the plot before, are radiating quite uh, strongly. And then you this allows the temperature to be um, lower to around 5 EV, where you find the ionization zone. And then uh, uh, from there, you now start to have uh, uh, ion and neutral interactions, charge exchange, till when you can reach temperature of around one EV where you find the recombination zone and then your diverter is finally detached. So this is how you can think about the whole process. Uh, what I was mentioning is that uh, the problem with detachment is that often is uh, associated with uh, uh, loss of the confinement. Uh, in, on the left, uh, I'm showing you some data from uh, the big talk among jet uh, in the UK, where they were showing that as they would increase uh, the uh, gas injector rate, uh, the uh, beta and so the confinement would, would go down. Uh, however, uh, the good news is that, uh, um, you know, we have also um, shown recently that, for instance, if we uh, combine detachment with the impurity seeding, so driven most of the impurity seeding, and for instance, with the uh, uh, diverter closure, so we find some way to optimize the diverter geometry and um, detachment, which is uh, um, shown here in uh, um, uh, on uh, on the right by the really big increase of uh, the neutral pressure in the diverter. And if you look at the uh, plot of the uh, WMHD, there is actually stable when you uh, add, uh, add uh, the nitrogen. So we can actually achieve detachment without uh, losing the performance. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so one important uh, uh, result that we started from uh, was that uh, it was known uh, that, for instance, from Alcator CMOD studies, uh, so, you know, already back in the 90s, that the detachment onset can be influenced by uh, diverter configuration through variation in uh, target and buffer geometry. So these were three examples from Arcator Simod where they were changing uh, the diverter geometry and they would see that they could access this detachment region, uh, for instance, easier if they would have a closer, uh, a closer diverter. 
And so what we did at uh, D3D, so the machine in, in San Diego, the machine has uh, uh, an open diverter on, uh, um, uh, on the lower part and uh, upper closed diverter, is that we installed another diverter, which is called the SAS, is in the upper part uh, over there, which is a uh, uh, very close diverter, it's a slot diverter, so it um, combines a uh, closure and target shaping to study even further this physics of uh, neutral and impurity trapping. But before I go there, I, I go further, you might ask, what is uh, the verbal closure? And this is a really good question. When we started to do the studies, we realized that, uh, um, you know, we wanted to have a, a better a definition of what the verbal closure is. So closure refers to the degree in which your recycling neutrals at the target can escape uh, the diverter. And I'm showing here, uh, these are uh, Monte Carlo trajectories from Irene, from Monte Carlo, um, uh, showing the comparison between the closed diverter and the open diverter. So you can see in the open diverter, these trajectories are going everywhere, right? They scatter everywhere, and this leads uh, to uh, low neutral accumulation. But in the closed diverter, uh, they are uh, well defined and these can lead to uh, ac accumulation of neutrals at the target. So we went and we tried to define a metric for uh, the verbal leakage, which we defined to study these studies on the verbal closure uh, as a the verbal leakage parameter, practically uh, kind of duration of uh, uh, how, how many um, uh, neutral would escape the, the verbal uh, over you know how many neutrals are born in the diverter, which is uh, you know given by the recycling and your uh, recombination. So we would do a cut around the x point, and then we would um, take this uh, this integral. And the uh, the result was that uh, you know the percentage of the neutral escaping the diverter at the detachment onset was much lower in the closed diverter compared to the open diverter. And we could see, for instance, from these 2D contour plot, you, uh, you can see here on the right that in the close uh, diverter, because of this uh, uh, buffer here, uh, practically you, you are uh, preventing the neutrals to go all the way uh, upstream to end contaminate the, the core. Instead, in the open diverter, you can see all the yellow part is going all the way up till the mid plane. And uh, uh, so we started to study the physics uh, of what was happening between the close and uh, the open diverter. And for instance, we found that there was a much higher dissipation in the closed diverter, which was due to a combination of both uh, the uh, impurity radiation and the volumetric losses. So not only the closed diverter has a, a higher power dissipation of the open, as you can see from like the black lines between the two uh, plots, uh, but also that uh, uh, the dissipation channel that was increasing was actually in the ion neutral losses and the neutral radiation. So it was because we were trapping more neutrals in the diverter, we were able to dissipate, uh, um, to dissipate more. Then um, another important part we found out is that uh, um, practically because uh, in the closed diverter, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the particles cannot escape. Um, you have uh, a reduced particle particle flow in the in, in terms of the conduction. So um, these two plots here on the right, which are um, comparing uh, some terms for the same density upstream at the separatrix. Uh, so you can see that uh, in uh, the open diverter, you have a much, uh, uh, which is would be the, the green line, like you have a, a more convected flux compared to uh, the closed diverter. And this, I will not go into the detail of this, but just to tell you that for the same separatric density upstream, the temperature in the open diverter is lower because there is a stronger flow in, uh, in the closed diverter. And uh, um, so practically, the uh, important uh, um, implication is that uh, 
this diverter now, this closed diverter can detach a lower upstream density because of an increased radiation losses, but also a reduced convection. So there is a, re a reduced particle flux and there is a reduced convection. And, and we actually tested all these results uh, uh, using um, also, you know, uh, so these are uh, salt PS simulations. So we were able uh, to demonstrate that the mechanism why the closed diverter was detaching, was performing better, was due to a decrease in the convective term and also an increase in the radiation losses and partially the momentum losses too. So through the use of these codes, we were able to answer what we were seeing experimentally. We were seeing experimentally that the closed diverter was performing better, was detaching a lower upstream density, but we didn't know why. And so this is where all this uh, interpretative work with these codes uh, can help us to get uh, important uh, um, questions answered. So now, uh, how can we reduce the vertical power loads to match the technological limit? We can use radiative cooling. We can uh, use detachment. With a vertical closure, we can use both of these things. So. I was introducing this before. We have uh, installed uh, this 3D, this uh, slot diverter, really to study this kind of physics. And what was uh, important about this uh, was that we had a lot of diagnostic, which was really unprecedented in such a closed diverter. Because you can imagine it's pretty hard to install a lot of diagnostic in a closed uh, diverter environment. And so this was really an important part, we were able to put a lot of diagnostic in so we could get a lot of good measurements and try to um, match with, uh, with the models. So the idea was that uh, we wanted to uh, test. So uh, I performed this first impurity seeding experiments in, in the SAS diverter. And the idea, we wanted to change the um, strike point location and we wanted to also change the impurities we were using. So in this case, and this is the what I was showing you before, we inject nitrogen uh, inside the plasma at three seconds, and then we increase the amount later on around uh, four. And uh, as you can see, uh, the WMHD, uh, once we, you know, we inject the, the nitrogen, which is around three seconds, stays stable. So confinement is there, it's not changing, it's not degrading. And we see a huge increase in the natural pressure uh, as measure, um, in the diverter and then from these, what we call the ASDEX gauges, and then was confirmed uh, also independently by uh, spectroscopy uh, results. So um, for instance, the uh, infrared spectrometer and the near spectrometer were all showing clear a signal of detachment. The uh, near spectrometer there was showing the appearance of the passion line that only happens when the temperature is below 2 EV. So we were really sure that the temperature was really low. And then it was confirmed by the Tavero Thompson scattering, which was actually detecting uh, temperature around 0 0.5 uh, once we were out, um, away from uh, around five seconds. So this was the first time we re really saw detachment through all the boundary diagnostics we could have. So this was really an, an, an important result. And what was interesting at that point is that if we would have changed the strike point location, so from the blue to the red, we would notice that the um, the amount of uh, impurity we would need to treat this detachment was different between the two the two strike points. You remember I showed you that you can uh, measure detachment as the rollover of the ion saturation current, which is this plot here. And so now you can see that in the blue case, um, we, we would only need the first nitrogen path to achieve this detachment to get this rollover, uh, whereas in uh, um, the red case, we would need additional nitrogen to actually uh, achieve the, uh, the rollover. And at the same time, if we were looking at the density profile in, into the core of the plasma, uh, now we would see that uh, in uh, uh, the red case, so when the strike point was there in the corner, we would uh, see more nitrogen going to the plasma compared to uh, the blue case. And we saw this consistently uh, through all the database, we tried different things, different power, different density. This results was there, was very robust. We needed higher um, 
level of uh, nitrogen in uh, in the red case and we found more nitrogen in the core um, in the red case. And other things that we did was, okay, now I'm gonna fix the strike point uh, on the blues, like the blue line, because it seems that that's what is working better. And I wanna change the impurity. I want to uh, compare, for instance, nitrogen with neon, especially neon is very interesting uh, for either a fusion reactor because uh, um, you know nitrogen is issues with ammonia formation. And so we really are interested in figuring out if neon is a good radiator. And, and so um, here are, for instance, the results. These are the lamiar probes, experimental probe result, where uh, you can see that uh, both nitrogen and neon were very efficient to reduce uh, the Q parallel, so the, the heat flux that was going under the further. However, uh, in uh, the case of uh, the neon, the particle flux into the diverter was uh, dramatically uh, reduced along with the neutral pressure. And so what is uh, happening here is that because the neon dissipates more upstream, uh, we are practically uh, living in the world without much to do. There is not much left to do down there because neon is actually dissipating upstream. And I'll show you this in a second. You can think, you maybe have heard about this, about the, the, the two-point model. Uh, do you guys have heard about the two-point model a little bit or no? no. Okay, so the two-point model is uh, a model that uh, try to... Um, reconcile the upstream density uh, with, uh, uh, you know, whatever happens down there at the diverter. And uh, practically, uh, the point here is to, to get is that, uh, so the diverter and the pedestal are connected through the heat flux term, so the Q parallel and the F rod, which is real radiation. Now, because neon is uh, uh, radiating upstream compared to nitrogen, um, is uh, practically reducing both your Q parallel and that term one minus F rod. And this actually can be seen also by this plot of the Q parallel at the diverter entrance. So, so where uh, we can just plot, you know, uh, how much uh, uh, parallel heat flux arrives right before it enters the diverter, so around the X point. And you could see that in the case of neon, this amount was already reduced uh, by, by half. So neon is radiating upstream and has an important implication because it uh, also means that uh, uh, it might require less scrap of layer density uh, to detach, which is uh, a, a good thing, for instance, from um, a core edge uh, perspective. I just wanted to uh, mention and uh, introduce a little bit more to so this old PS. So uh, following all these experimental work, uh, uh, we went and, uh, uh, you know, did uh, the, for, this happened actually for the very first time. Um, I, I, I was able to introduce the multiple uh, species uh, um, in, in Sol PS to, um, to do this work at D3D with the drifts and neutral neutral collision activated on uh, into this code. Um, Sol PS is a, a scrape of layer plasma solver, so is the uh, combination, is the coupling of B2 and Irene Monte Carlo. So the way that this works um, is that B2 provides the plasma background to Irene Monte Carlo, which uh, calculated the sources and the sinks so due to neutrals and molecules, and then this gives this formation back to uh, the multi-fluid uh, plasma code. And uh, uh, so in this work, uh, uh, we had uh, the full consistent model for all these particle drifts, which I'm going to show you, they are important. Um, so particle drifts are induced by electric fields in the diverter, which usually arise from gradients in the temperatures profile. In these experiments, uh, we had uh, uh, this particle drift, we call it the ion B grab B into the uh, diverter. So this just depends on uh, which is the direction of the BT field, right, compared to the IP. So in this, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the particle drift were moving this way, as you can see from the arrows. And then um, if we go and uh, we plot uh, the ionization 
uh, 2D contour plot comparing with drifts and without drift, you can see how uh, with drift we could see that it was a shift in the ionization source radially towards the inner target, so where these drifts are going. And also that if we would change the stripe point, right, as we did in the experiments, we were also uh, finding different ionization distribution. In one case, on the left, the source was trapped in the slot. In the other case, the source was more out in the common region. So the different stripe point location were corresponding to different vetted area with a different uh, um, distribution of the ionization source. And uh, uh, so here we embarked in, in uh, a, a new work, uh, which was really try to understand the uh, impurity transport and leakage out of the diverter. Um, so for instance, in the, uh, in the way that uh, uh, the purity distribution is uh, implemented in this code, in the salt PS, uh, in the stationary form is uh, practically uh, the balance between all these forces. Uh, and if you go and you make a plot of uh, these forces for these experimental results I showed you earlier, you'll find a plot like this. Uh, and so we find out that uh, the main two forces really are the friction and the thermal. Uh, forces. So, so these are the, uh, the, the the dominant forces. Now, from the momentum balance equation, you can actually derive the uh, parallel velocity for an impurity, which you can write as uh, uh, the parallel velocity for the main ions and a term that depends on the gradient of the temperature. And so you can see from these uh, uh, plots here on uh, on the right, for instance, that there is a large difference between your magenta curve and uh, uh, the other curve, one is for nitrogen, one is for neon, so for the impurity. And this large difference between the two curves is due to the thermal force, which is now extracting your impurities out of the diver, and we can leak this impurity impurity out. Uh, an important thing that we were seeing uh, was actually the occurrence of a flow reversal. So a flow that uh, is going out of the diverter. Um, this flow reversal was found for both the main ions and the impurities. And you can see, for instance, right, you have that uh, red uh, little, uh, little curve here in the middle of the blue. Um, which you know just indicates it's a counter um, counter uh, uh, velocity direction, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, what was happening because we had uh, a large uh, a large closure. So we had so much closure in there that uh, with not much enough pumping, that the impurities were left with you know just turning out their their flow. And uh, and this is important because that means that the impurity can be directed upstream, not only when the main ions are upstream, but also if you have a very strong thermal force. Uh, and this can create impurity leakage, and now you're leaking your impurities out of the diverter, for instance. The last thing that you want to take into account is the contribution of these particle drifts I was just mentioning before. In this case, the difference between the two curves is due to the particle drifts. So the particle drifts are important. So ultimately, uh, you, can, uh, um, you can say that your impurity leakage is really determined by the poloidal velocity, which is uh, the product. Uh, so it can be written as the parallel velocity of the impurity. Uh, the poloidal projection, really, of the uh, the parallel velocity of the impurity and the terms that depends on these uh, drifts. Uh, so these drifts, these particle drifts, are essential to capture this uh, uh, dynamic. And, and and this was important because uh, um, these capabilities of uh, uh, including uh, drifts, it, it wasn't even uh, thinkable like just 10 years ago. And, and so this just tells you how much this was a huge effort. Being able to introduce the drifts was a huge effort that was going on through many different institutions, a lot of people working on this. Just to give you an idea how, you know, uh, you know if you uh, really have some um, uh, computational uh, breakthrough kind of, uh, then they can really help the interpretation of things. So now we knew we know that uh, you know uh, drifts are important. Um, then, um, well, 
I mean, here I would just wanted to show you that, you know, uh, finally, uh, a lot of things depend also on the ionization, ionization potential. Uh, for instance, nitrogen ionizes at low temperature, so below the stagnation point uh, for the deuterium. So this is one of the reasons why it is retained. And this can be seen by the two plots above where the uh, ionization region is for the impurities actually below the one of the deuterium. Uh, for ne neon, for instance, the situation is different because neon uh, has a higher ionization potential and so tends uh, to leak out more just uh, naturally. Uh, one thing uh, that uh, was also important that we saw from the experiments is that uh, uh, compared to uh, nitrogen, we have been seeing that neon was penetrating much more efficiently uh, into the diverter. Uh, so while not much nitrogen was going compared to the neon, neon was entering uh, the core and steepening the pedestal. Because I just told you the neon is actually uh, leaking also naturally through the uh, ionization potential. And so... In, in this sense, we have identified a self-enhancing mechanism of the neon buildup um, into the pedestal. So we start from the diverter, right? We inject these impurities in the diverter. Now, this impurity can, for instance, leak out. So this mechanism I've been showing you. Uh, now it's pushing the diverter, and you have these plots here on the right just to show you practically your neon is building up into your uh, pedestal, there can uh, help out to increase your uh, pedestal stability. And uh, this is what is uh, uh, shown in, uh, uh, in these plots in, in the center. Just, just the only thing that you need to know is that practically going from the left to the right, so as the time is increasing, we have more impurity, we can have more stabilization of the pedestal. Um, but now, because uh, we have uh, also um, these impurities inside the ELM frequency, which is that instability I show, I show you at the very beginning, uh, which is helping to uh, flush out the impurities, is actually decreasing the ELM frequency, uh, which means that you have less capability to expel these impurities out of the core. So you want to be careful because you want to have a balance between being able, you know, right, to have these impurities to do the job, but also you need to try to expel uh, these impurities out of the diverter. So this is a, a self-financing mechanism and everything, you know, comes together. That's where the core edge integration is. You need to take into account all these different pieces. Um, so practically, um, we, you know, we were working on building this integrated scenario where, um, you know, we could show that you can choose uh, the appropriate impurities depending, you know, on your um, pedestal and, and core conditions. You can try to optimize your geometry. We could see that even just changing the strike point location was leading to very different results. So think if you're, you're going to be, uh, you know, changing your diverter structure, you can uh, have a room for optimizing your heat flux and then uh, take into account uh, uh, drift for uh, particle entrainment. Uh, so uh, as a summary, um, practically, if uh, you know we want to really optimize the uh, core edge integration, this really relies on using uh, radiative power exhaust. Uh, impurity signaling is mandatory uh, and is actually also important. Uh, for improving confinement if it's well utilized, but we need to uh, control the impurity amount to avoid uh, like dilution or a collapse. We also need to take into account non-coronal conditions and that the verter closure is beneficial uh, to high density diverter and to reduce uh, the uh, neutral leakage. Uh, and that, uh, you know, we can have research strategies uh, uh, for uh, combining, for instance, our geometries, plasma flow, scrape of layer, impurity transport. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before I close, this is another new thing that we are doing. You know, we were wondering if the H mode is the only way to go. We have uh, put a lot of effort um, uh, lately in uh, negative triangularity which is practically we reverse the shape of the plasma. And this has shown to actually be uh, beneficial in terms of uh, uh, power exhaust, also because it doesn't have these uh, instabilities at the element. It seems to have a good uh, confinement. We have done a 
the 3D negative triangularity campaign earlier this year. And uh, uh, there are a lot of results that are coming out. This is something I just show at APS actually, where we have uh, a rich, uh, achieved the first uh, uh, characterization of the operational space at uh, high radiation. Um, so there will be result coming out soon, but you know, someone is interested and I'm happy to talk about that. And then um, consideration for future uh, work. Uh, so I think the purity transport from the wall to the core is an outstanding issue. Uh, we are actually uh, working uh, so uh, with my group to develop a new code capability for that. Uh, improvement of the model for the scrape of layer, uh, detachment study including turbulence, uh, um, and then uh, you know new model for also you know scrape of layer interaction. These are all important things that. Um, you know, are my needed and you, you guys might be working on, I don't know. Um, so uh, I think I can take any, any, I have more stuff, but uh, I'll take questions. 